Hello Internet! This is the stability map of a proportional controller applied to an oscillator. It is a function of sampling time and gain, and the sampling time is relative to the oscillation period of the plant. Let's see what this graph means. Here you have a gain of 0.2 with a sampling time of 0.45. The corresponding step response looks like this. It's not great, not terrible. This low gain doesn't do much, but it's definitely stable. Let's get the sampling time down to 0.2. Same gain, more than twice as fast sampling and it's unstable. Even weirder, if we move to negative gain, which produces a positive feedback loop, it becomes stable. Horrible controller, you give it a step response and it goes the other way. But it's stable. Moving on to t equals 2.45, so about two and a half times the oscillation period, you can see the plant output swinging between steps, but the controller is still stable. So far, the plant has been a simple harmonic oscillator without damping. Let's see how damping changes the map. You get these spikes in the available gain, because sampling itself acts as a kind of filter for the oscillating part, and you control it something like a first order system. The gain can be much higher, though you get these oscillating peaks in the analog output that are not great. Next, let's add the derivative term. Normally, if you have an underdamped second order system, you use PD control at least. So let's add that derivative term and zoom in in the first period. The derivative didn't help much at the sampling rate we are at, but give us this dead zone in the middle where no gain is stable. Moving down to very short sample times, this is where you get the control performance you're probably used to. The step response is similar to an analog controller, the gain can be fairly high. The rule of thumb is to sample around 10 to 25 times faster than the plant, so I guess we can confirm it. But it can be interesting to see the bigger picture, beyond these best practices. Before we jump into the details of control, we need to deal with aliasing. Here's a sine wave and its unit circle representation. Watch how we hit the sample points as we sweep around the curve. You can think of them as checkpoints. Now I'll keep the radius as reference, but move the dot uh, with 9 times the speed, so it's running laps around the reference. Why 9 exactly? We have 8 sample points to complete one lap plus the one to catch up with the slower reference. Now I'll hide the running points and you'll only see the sampling checkpoints. Can you guess the path of the running point? Which one was it? The slow one or the fast one? Or perhaps this one? It is in fact impossible to tell, this is the Nyquist-Shannon sampling theorem. This leads people to say you must use sampling frequency at least twice as fast as your system. This is necessary for signal reconstruction, but it is not the whole story for control. Let's see how you get to the stability map. You start with your system description in continuous time and discretize it. Now that you have your sample system, you apply feedback control. Then you derive the characteristic equation of the closed loop system. The roots of this, the poles of the system, must lie inside the unit circle on the complex plane. This tends to be difficult to handle, so you apply the bilinear transform to get a new set of poles that need to lie on the left half plane. And for this set of poles, you can use the Rao Thurwitz criteria to determine stability. First off, here's our example system. It's an LC circuit with the capacitor voltage measured in the AD converter and the inductor voltage generated by the DA converter. The controller is just a proportional gain and there is one unit delay to model digital delays. Here's the system description in differential equation form. I'll introduce new variables y and omega to put it into a standard second order ODE form, and this helps telling the difference between the measured and output voltage, otherwise we'd have too many U's. 
Solving differential equations is not our focus today, so I'm just gonna run through the key steps. You can find plenty of good resources on the topic online. You start by looking for the homogeneous solution in exponential form and solving for the lambda roots. The roots we get are plus minus j omega. Then you go look for the particular solution using the initial condition and the input u. Thanks to the Euler formula you can change your variables and functions from the complex exponentials to sine and cosine functions and then you derive the solution using the initial conditions. Now you can put the solution into a matrix form like this. This will tell you the value of y and the derivative at time t. All you do next is plug in the sampling time, uppercase t, where this tells you how to get from the initial condition to the next sample. And then you use the result from the previous sample as initial condition for the next transition. Here's how it works on a second order system. Um, this one has damping because it looks nicer. You have all these sample points that are, in the end, just evaluating the response function. Take a look at the first sample. If sampling time is flexible, the discretization process is exactly the same as deriving the step response. You move up to the first sample period and take note of the states. You get a new input and you start over the step response with the previous states as initial conditions. The key to this process is the zero order hold on the DAC output. Thanks to the zero order hold, the input to the plant is piecewise constant. So we just derived the discrete time state update matrices using the ODE solution. More generally, you can use matrix exponentials to derive these matrices. However, matrix exponentials are a kind of shorthand for the ODE solution. There are great algorithms to compute the matrix exponential numerically. If you want to stay symbolic, the way to go is to find the eigenvalues and eigenvectors of the A matrix, and that is more or less the same amount of work as just solving the ODE. For example, both include finding the same roots. Another interesting point here is to look at the transition matrices at pi and 2 pi. When omega t equals pi, it means we're sampling exactly twice for each period of the oscillator, and this makes the derivative uncontrollable. After substitution, if you look at the second row of the matrices, neither the input u nor the first variable y has any effect on y dot. And when the sampling time matches the oscillator period, the system is completely uncontrollable, u has no effect on the states. I'm actually a bit uncertain if this is a controllability or an observability problem. Technically, it's a controllability due to the matrices. But physically, the voltage output does have an effect on the system, it's just hidden from us by the sampling. So part of me wants to say this is an observability problem. Leave me a comment what you think. This is what happens with this aliasing. At pi, the derivative stays zero. Technically, it changes sign every step. You just won't see it because it starts at zero. At 2 pi, the system just swings back where it started, so you can't measure anything new. Moving on, let's close that control loop. Here we have our state matrices for the plant, and the control law with the delay. They can be combined into a matrix equation like so, and this gives you the state transition matrix for the closed loop system f hat. The state variables will evolve like f hat to the power of k, that is why it is necessary that f hat should be kinda less than 1 to make it a decreasing power series. More precisely, the eigenvalues of f hat need to be less than 1. And to get the eigenvalues, you need to solve the characteristic equation. Now f hat is quite a large matrix. The characteristic equation looks like this, after all the simplifications off screen. Here we have a choice to just solve it with the Cardano formula, or we can use the bilinear transform and then look for roots with negative real values. You see, the bilinear transform applied to the unit circle gives the imaginary axis, 
and the thing inside the unit circle is mapped to the left of the imaginary axis. Let's prove it quickly. If lambda is on the unit circle, then it can be described as e to the j phi. And then v is this expression. And after multiplying and dividing by e to the minus j phi over 2, you get complex conjugates. And uh, adding and subtracting complex conjugates like this leads to the elimination of the real part. Now we'll go ahead and substitute the formula for lambda into the characteristic equation and after reductions, it looks like this. Finally, we can apply the Ralph Hurwitz stability criteria. This was developed in order to tell if the roots of polynomials will be negative without actually computing them. However, the actual process for higher degree polynomials is quite long, there are good sources online explaining it. In this video I'll just give you the result for third degree. The criteria are that all coefficients of the polynomial must be positive, and the product of a1, a2 minus the product of a0, a3 must also be positive. So here's our polynomial in variable v, and here are the coefficients listed. The term a0 will always be larger than 0, except for the edge case where cosine omega t is minus 1, so that's our first restriction. For the a1 term, it yields that p must be larger than cosine plus 1 over cosine minus 1. And also we need to avoid division by 0, so let's add that to the cosine term above. Cosine omega t must not be plus minus 1. The a2 term yields that p must be less than half. And the a3 term yields that p must be greater than minus 1. Next, for this complicated term, I'll show you the steps for the edge case with equality. So, first you can get rid of the cosine minus 1 terms on both sides, you can rearrange the a1 part on the left and then divide by cosine plus 1. This gives you that plus 1 that you can expand and sort out the p and minus 1 terms on the right. Here you can divide by p, but also take note that p equals 0 is an alternative solution. Then you work all the terms to the right, and you get p equals 2 times cosine omega t plus 1 over cosine omega t minus 1. If you do the proper derivation with the inequality, the solution is that p must lie between 0 and this rational function, both when it is positive and when it is negative. Let's put these conditions on a graph. I'm gonna use 2 pi for the value of omega. First, the cosine can't be exactly plus minus 1, so the sampling times are not possible. Next, p must be larger than this rational function. p must be between half and minus 1. And finally, p must be between 0 and this rational function. Combining these conditions gives us the area of stability. Now if you wanted to create this stability map for other systems, say an oscillator with damping, you can follow the same steps, just start with the different plant and closed loop matrices. Here's the closed loop matrix I used for the first part of the video for the damped oscillator with PD control. Though instead of going symbolic all the way, I cheated a bit and used brute force numeric solution instead. It took my machine like 4 or 5 hours total just to pre-calculate the dataset for the stability map. Anyway, that's all I had for today. Hope you found that interesting. Thanks for watching, bye.